Happy Monday to you. Welcome back to the Front Porch. Time once again for another episode of Monday Meditations. Hope you're off to a great start this week. You're enjoying this beautiful day that God has given to us. And you're ready to meditate a little bit more on God's Word. Spend a little time with the Word of God. It's never going to be a fruitless journey when we spend time with the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And without faith, we can't please God. We'll see later on in this text as well. But one a friend of mine was, I was looking at some of his studies on the book of Proverbs, and he likened verses 15 through 29 as that of an investment, looking at it from an investment standpoint. Uh, category or standpoint. If you're focusing on putting some energy or some effort, some time into something, you expect to get some gain. Well, verses 30 and 31, he titled that part as incentives. There's incentives to doing this. And again, most of the chapter 11, we've talked about balances. We talked about weights, just weights and balances in the first part of that. We talked about rejoicing then, of course, in righteousness and doing what's right. The benefit that comes from doing what's right and the problems that come from choosing what's wrong. So let's dig into this a little bit more as we're down to verse 22 and focus on what Solomon has to say about the blessings of rejoicing in righteousness and the consequences of choosing error. He says, verse 22, as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. There are certain images that, that you can't unsee, and this is one of those. Who would put a gold ring in the, in the nose of a, of a pig that's going to be out rooting around in the mud and the muck? It's, it, it takes away, it tarnishes the value of that that gold piece that is so valuable, that's so precious, putting it in a swine. That, that, that's, you can see that imagery. That, that would be un, unheard of. But then he says, that's what it looks like for a beautiful or a fair woman to not have discretion. Discretion could be translated as, as the idea of, of having, having judgment, not having good judgment. Or some even say it's the idea of taste. She lacks taste. And not being able to taste food, that's not what we're talking about. It's the, the discernment, the judgment to say that this, this is not becoming of the beauty that God has given to you. Taking for granted, taking advantage of and abusing the blessing that has been given to this person. That, that's what a wicked person is like. That's what a person without discernment, without judgment is like. A person who is like a beautiful woman who doesn't have that is like a gold ring in the nose of a pig. That's this disgusting imagery, isn't it? But that's what God sees. And we've seen that before at times when people aren't living up to their potential and being what they were created to be. Verse 23 says, The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. The desire of the righteous, what he longs for, what she longs for, the righteous person is always good. Notice again what he said, it's only good. That's the only thing they're going to be focused on. That's the only thing they're going to have in their lives are things that are good. They're longing for those things. They're desiring those things. But then he goes on to say the expectation, the only thing to look forward to, of the wicked is wrath, or some translations have fury, an overwhelming fury. That's the only thing we have to look forward to if we're wicked people, if we choose the path of, of rejection and rebellion against God's word. That's all we have to look forward to. But the righteous person, their desire, what makes them happy, is only that which is good, what God calls good. Verse 24. There is that scattereth, literally, and I'm going to go ahead and set this stage now, and some modern, more modern translations have it this way, and, and it's good. There is one that, think about it that way, there is one, it's implied, there is one that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is one, implied, that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. There is one that scatters. And we're not talking about aimlessly broadcasting without any kind of uh, sense to that or pattern to that at all. But he's, he's generous. We're going to see this come back again in the uh, next verses or two here. He's generous in what he does, in what he gives. He doesn't withhold those things. He's generous in that. It's going to come back to him. Again, what does he say? He increases. When he scatters, when he gives, he increases. But the one, again, who upholdeth or withholds more than is necessary, more than is meat. It's not necessary for him to hold more than that. 
he's doing so uh, out of greed or, or gluttony or those kind of things, whatever it may be. His motives are impure. He doesn't. He holds back more than he needs to hold back. He says it's going to tend to poverty. It's going to come back to him. And so then in verse 25, the liberal soul or the generous soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. This generous person who's who's willing to help, who's willing to not not withholding things from others who have need, give and it shall be given unto you. We see that in the New Testament as well. Jesus would say, "It's more blessed to give than to receive." We see that in the Book of Acts, in Acts chapter twenty. And so, giving is a is it's a staple, it's a foundational concept of Christianity. Not being greedy, not being stingy. Give and it shall be given to you. Again, it's the idea a liberal or a generous soul shall be made fat. He's not going to be without. And when you water, when you encourage, when you motivate others, that encouragement and that watering is going to come back to you as well. A man that that has those kind of relationships in his life, that he's been there for other people, will have people to be there for him. Not always. There's some people who, who are just takers. There's some people that's all that they're here for is just to take. And there's some people that give. And that's all they're going to do is give. There's a balance in this, absolutely. and he's But he's emphasizing the blessings for that. When we meditate upon these, we're investing in that. We're investing in others' lives. We're trying to help them to see Jesus in this world. And Jesus was, of course, a giver. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's being Christ-like in this world. Look at the next verse now, verse 26. It says, He that withholdeth corn, or grain, the people shall curse him, but blessings shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. He's using uh, this idea of commerce. And there are some people who they want to store up and they want to hold back some of their goods to, to increase the, the desire, to increase the want for that, and so they can increase the price on that and taking advantage of people. That's, he says, righteous don't do that. That's not the way you do that. The people will hate you. But you sell when there's a time of need, when people have need, you'll get, you'll get praise of people. You'll get the, you'll get the service you get the selling and you'll get the love of the people. You'll get, you'll get to make the money that you need to provide for your family and those kind of things. But also you'll win the people over as well because you're doing what is right. You're doing what is just. Again, going back earlier into this same chapter in the first verse of this chapter when he talks about false balances and taking advantage of the customer, oh, that's going to come back on you and you'll end up losing your business. He says you'll have this blessing upon the head of him that selleth it, verse 26. Verse 27, he that diligently seeketh good procureth favor, but he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. First part of this verse reminds me of a phrase in Hebrews chapter 11. Of course, many of you, if you've studied Hebrews, you've studied Hebrews chapter 11, you know that's the great faith chapter. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. But he that cometh unto God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. You see this idea? A rewarder of who? Those that diligently seek him. Same idea we see in verse 27, the first part of this. He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor. God's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, he is the ultimate good, is he not? We have to seek him and we receive that reward. But he that seeketh mischief it shall come to him. You find what you're looking for. We will find what we're looking for. That's what he's saying. Ultimately, over and over again, the Proverbs is a heavy reminder of you reap what you sow. We see that in the New Testament. We've mentioned it many times in our Monday meditations. Verse 28 carrying the same idea again. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. He that trusts in his riches. He didn't say he that has riches is going to fall. It's he that trusts in his riches. When I think about that, I'm reminded of what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And hold your place in Proverbs 11. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 9. He says, 
But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Why? For the love of money is the root of all evil, literally, the love and the desire for money is the root of all kinds of evil. He then says, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Same idea that Solomon was saying long ago. Now, if anyone knew about the effects riches can have on one's life, was it not Solomon? The half has not been told of the wealth and the gain that this man had. But nevertheless, he says, if you look for those things, yeah, you'll fall. If that's your focus, the love of money, and trusting in those riches, you'll fall. But contrast that, the righteous, those who do what's right, flourish as a branch, a healthy branch that's budding and it's, it's vibrant with life. That's what, we're, that's what we should be striving for. Verse 29 then says, He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. You trouble your own house, the only thing you have to inherit is the storms, the, the hurricanes, force winds, the tornadoes. That's, that's what you're doing. You're destroying your own home. You're destroying yourself in this. If that's what you're seeking, if you're troubling your own house, the only thing you have to look forward to is the storms. But he goes on to say, the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. Eventually, you'll find yourself, this fool's going to find himself serving those who are wise, those who have discretion. And then, as we bring this chapter to a close, verses 30 and 31, as one of those who previously noted, this denotes the idea of the incentives behind why we should rejoice in righteousness, why we should want to do what's right. He says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous, the reward, the the offspring of righteousness is a tree of life. The tree of life is referenced in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. A tree that is, if it's eaten of, one lives forever. The tree of life is referenced again in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, being as in heaven. We're to partake of that tree of life and live forever with him. But that's reserved for the righteous. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they sinned. They were taken away from that tree of life. But Jesus came to be the source of life for mankind to bring us back to the opportunity to take hold of that tree of life in Christ. We have that blessing. And so, the fruit of the righteous, a tree of life. And he that winneth souls. The word winneth could be translated as, a, as ensnaring, as in capturing. That's, that's kind of the idea that we're, we're involved in this world, we're in this world, and the sole purpose of our existence in this world is to fear God and keep His commandments. And one of the last commands God gave to His apostles before He left this earth was to preach the gospel to every creature. Teach them to walk in the path of light. Teach them of the soul-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. We're to win those souls for Christ, pointing them to the cross. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. He's using his children, his faithful children, Christians, to draw them to that cross. Teach them the word of God. Teach them the love of Christ. Teach them about that tree of life. Verse 31 then says, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth much more, much more, the wicked and the sinner. What does he mean by this? The righteous shall be recompensed in the earth? Yes, even in this world, we receive blessings for doing what's right. Ultimately, the blessing is, of course, heaven. But what about the wicked and the sinner? Go over with me to the book of First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, starting with verse 17, says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? It's a rhetorical question. 
if the, he says then in verse 18, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? It seems maybe a little bit bleak, doesn't it? That's not the point Peter's trying to make. The Holy Spirit's not trying to make that point through Peter either. The point is, this is a reality that we have to be prepared for. We reap what we sow. And if the righteous will be recompensed in this earth, will not the wicked, will not the sinner be recompensed? We get those things based on how we line our lives up with God's Word and our desire to be what God wants us to be. It's not a meritorious earning salvation. The thing we do earn is the latter part of this. We earn death and destruction because of sin. But God offers us His grace. Titus chapter 2, starting verse 11, the concept of grace being made available to all men. It is made available to all men, but that grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age. And if we don't do that, well, Solomon said long ago, and the scripture still holds true, we reap what we sow. Brothers and sisters, friends, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23, but the gift of God is eternal life through his Son. Same thing he's talking about here. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. He came to give us an abundant life, John 10.10. 10. And the abundant life is a good life here in this world, but a great life there with him for all eternity. Are we living for him? Are we rejoicing in righteousness? Or are we practicing wickedness? A tree of life? or destruction of darkness. The choice is ours. What will you choose? And that's something on which we can meditate this Monday and every day. May God bless you till we meet again.